Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Today we're going to take a look at Mercury's square to Uranus, which is happening over the weekend. This square is actually taking place as Mercury goes right through a Kazemi with the Sun, and then the Sun swaps places with Mercury and squares Uranus at the time of the full moon. So it is a very Uranian weekend, but I wanted to look at Mercury's square to Uranus in particular, since Mercury's retrograde, and look at sort of five radical Mercury-Uranus ideas, because one of the things that happens quite frequently when these two planets get together is we have these light bulb moments, these kind of aha moments where we think a brand new thought or we come up with a new idea or we see something very differently. So I want to give you some examples of the kinds of ideas that Mercury-Uranus often provide us with and play with some of the symbolism in the sky surrounding the Mercury-Uranus dynamic this weekend. So anyway, that's what we're doing Today, before we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe. Share your comments if you have them. If you have any insights to share, we love hearing from you guys. Transcripts of any of my daily talks can be found on the website, which is nightlightastrology.com. When you go over to the website, I want to show you a, a sale that we are running. The sale is running through the 27th of this month. If you go to the courses page, we have a brand new Astrology Essentials course. This is a beginner's beginner's course which means that it is something you could take if you are thinking about uh, enrolling in our first year program. Of course, we have a first, second, third year program, a horary program, four years worth of astrological uh, certification programs that we offer. But we had yet to make a course that was for absolute beginners, people who are totally brand new to astrology, uh, because even people entering our first year program often have a little astrology under their belt already. But most of that is pieced together by online research and just kind of learning as you go on the fly. So this is meant for total beginners. This would be good for a family member or a friend who's a total beginner and interested in what you're doing when you listen to all this astrology content. You'll see the modules listed out. This is under the courses page, of course, on the website. And at the bottom, you'll find um, the early bird payment. This lasts until August 27th. This is a fully recorded course. It will be released mid-September when we open enrollment for the fall program, for the fall year one program. So this is effectively a pre-sale. The release will be mid-September. You can save significantly on the on the cost of the course by purchasing it now. So we hope that some of you will be able to take advantage of that. And also, um, I want to point out that we have a good live talk coming up. I'm giving my next webinar, monthly webinar on August 22nd, the eighth house place of karmic debts. If you want to learn more about the eighth house, your eighth house in your birth chart, this is a great talk that will sort of clear up some misconceptions while also digging pretty deeply into why this house has so much to do with karmic contracts that we have with other living beings. So uh, that will be a good one. And I hope to see you there. If you can't make it live, of course, it is recorded for you. Um, if you, when you register, you get the link to attend live and then you get the recording later. And that beginner's course is all recorded so you can work through it at your own pace. All right, so on that note, let's turn our attention to the real-time clock and I can point out what we're looking at today, which is the retrograde of Mercury into the square with Uranus. Here we have it. So here we are on Friday. And you can see that Friday, August 16th, Mercury is just a degree away from Uranus. And what's going to happen is we're going to see the two of them get together in a square on Saturday, August 17th into Sunday, August 18th. And then the sun swaps places with Mercury and hits the square to Uranus at the same time that the full moon is also hitting the square to Uranus. So it's a very Uranian weekend uh, coming into the early part Monday of next week. So what I want to look at today are the kinds of ideas that you can expect from the combination of Mercury and Uranus, because one of the most basic significations of Mercury and Uranus is original thinking. Ways of thinking or ways of looking at a situation, a very particular situation or life itself that are unique and often the combination of Mercury and Uranus will take a well-established idea or a very commonly held idea that there's not necessarily anything wrong with, but it will say, hey, let's flip that on its head and have you consider the opposite. Um, Mercury Hermes is very fluid like that and loves to play with opposites. And Uranus is the light bringer who will often illuminate in a combination with Mercury by exposing us to the opposite. 
So that's what we're looking at with this. And all of these ideas, none of them are mandatory for this transit. They are just for your consideration. So one of the, I want to start with this one. One of the things that happens most regularly when Mercury and Uranus get together is that you will experience synchronicities. So, um, whoops, I want to show you something. And of course, I would mess up my screen here. <clears throat> okay, so here's a good, here is a good example of synchronicity. So let's say that, <clears throat> let's say that you're really, I wrote this one down so I could have my notes here. So let's say you're really frustrated with your kids one afternoon and you, 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 you realize that your time management skills are, they need to improve, right? And you are, are frustrated with your, your children, but you're more deeply frustrated with the, your schedule, let's say. And so you're getting, <clears throat> you're getting really flustered with the kids. And in a moment you go, I've had enough. I'm enough. I need to take a break. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go for a walk. And as soon as you say that, let's say that there's an, a clock on the wall and you haven't hit anything, nothing's happened. Just randomly that clock falls off the wall and breaks. <laughs> and you look at that and you go, did I just cause that to happen? No, I, it, it's not that my reaching this breaking point and thinking about time management and taking saying to my kids, I'm going to go take a walk. Ideally, you maybe your partner's in the house or, <laughs> or they're old enough where that's okay, right? But you go, I'm going for a walk and then a clock falls off the wall and breaks. And you you see the two events as symbolically correlated, even though they are not causally correlated. In other words, you didn't just cause that to happen. Not in any obvious way. So that's a synchronicity. There's lots of examples. People have stretched the definition of synchronicity to mean things like thinking of a friend and they call you the next day or whatever. But the idea is that synchronicities are quite common when Mercury and Uranus get together. So here's a radical idea. And this is along the lines of the, the full moon that's coming through with Leo Aquarius in the mix. What if, because sometimes synchronicities are, are like, like in that moment, if you're that parent, the falling of the clock has just confirmed for you that you need a different kind of time. You know, so there's, it's like symbolically, it's speaking, it's very personal. But the radical, a radical Mercury Uranus kind of idea would be that a synchronicity is not always for you. It doesn't have to be a message, an instruction, a confirmation, um, a wink from the universe that you're on the right path. It can be all of those things. But also sometimes I think that synchronicities, and this is a very Mercury Uranus kind of idea, flip something on its head, right? Synchronicities are nothing more than like the fact of eternity, which we miss all the time because we live in a world that experiences kind of time and a linear sequence of things. Synchronicities are nothing more than eternity popping through and going, ah, everything's actually completely interconnected and simultaneously occurring and causality is a kind of illusion. <laughs> And so sometimes synchronicities are just reminders that we are eternal beings living in eternity and we don't, we lose track of it. So one great benefit, one relieving, freeing benefit of uh, this idea is that when a synchronicity happens, you can relieve yourself of the burden of having to take some message and go on some mission because of what the synchronicity has instructed you to do or has confirmed or something. Instead, you can just go, ah, that's right. I'm, I'm living in an eternal world. I am an eternal being. And that's very freeing because it doesn't have to be about you. It can just be about the eternal nature of things. So that's a very liberating Mercury Uranus kind of thought with attached to a very mercury uranus kind of phenomenon which are synchronicities number two thoughts are archetypal here's something that we miss all the time if you meditate you've heard this before from a meditation teacher probably you are not your thoughts you are thinking and what we're trying to do when we say that is not condemn thinking it's not to say that we don't have that there isn't value in the thinking part of us or something like that 
But it is to say that if you don't have space in which to relate to or reflect upon your thoughts, you will often get identified with them and then be possessed and ride the roller coaster of being identified with your thoughts. So we want to get some space so we can relate to, reflect upon, interact with our thoughts. And um, this is where things like internal family systems make a lot of sense. And uh, meditation that teaches us to get some distance and be able to see the thoughts streaming through as the observer, they're all giving us skills to be able to relate to our thoughts. Astrology does the same thing. Try this on for size. When Mercury and Uranus come through, and I swear to God, you can do this. Any Mercury-Uranus aspect, or if it's transiting in your chart, you can do this too. And it's it's like the faculty to do this particular exercise grows exponentially under the transits of Mercury and Uranus. And that is to observe your thoughts and then to notice that they are archetypal. Whatever you're thinking about the world or what's happening in the news or what's happening in your friend's life or what's happening in your own life or your relationship, just notice the quality of the voice. It's like a story that's being told. And the reasoning and the perceptions and the opinions they all have an archetypal bent to them. See if you can spot the gods and goddesses in the mix of your thoughts. When you do that, it's really amazing how you'll come to go at times. I'm not saying we don't have our own like mental and intellectual agency, but I am saying that it's amazing how much we think of as our own thoughts that are actually reflections of the planetary aspects that are happening in the sky. We think they're our thoughts, but they're actually the gods and goddesses mingling in our thoughts. What is really original, what is really freeing is to be able to identify and name the gods. And then again, suddenly we have space and we might have more flexibility in how we're thinking about things. Number three is that our forgiveness and our uncertainty free us, whereas our judgments and let's call it our, our overly confident certainty condemn us. So the thing is, is that I don't think it's, I don't think it's a sin to have beliefs, right? I don't think it's a sin to have a, a sense that you know, you feel pretty good about the things you believe to be true or real or important. But if we don't hold a, a kind of tension between our beliefs and what we feel to be true and a, a humble sense of uncertainty and mystery, what happens is that whenever it's time for us to learn something new and figure out, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know this, I, it's not what I thought it was, I wasn't in possession of the total truth, I didn't see something, it will be so much harder and more painful when we have uh, built up a set of perceptions or truth claims on um, the, the like, on the foundation of self-righteousness. That is, when it, when it comes to undoing and learning, like undoing false beliefs or enhancing or clarifying what is true in any given situation or in our lives or how we look at reality, the harder and more self-righteous uh, we are, generally the more hypocritical we are, by the way, then when it comes time to learning and opening and expanding our mind and our perception of things, it's like so much more painful because the karma is being undone and it's you live by the sword, you die by the sword. If you have self-righteousness behind or within the way you look at things and there's not a humility, it, which is not about not believing anything. It's about, it's about holding a certain degree of mystery and uncertainty in how you believe or how you go about looking at things. It'll be much more difficult. So anyway, uh, same thing for looking at other human beings. When we, when our ideas about other human beings are very rigid, uh, you know, and it's funny, I heard someone in India one time, a teacher in India say that when you have judgments of other people, you are essentially buying stock in their karma. <laughs> I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's like, okay. And you, and it pays dividends. So you get to participate in their karma when you hold judgments about other people. The same thing is true. We may have perceptions about other people. We can notice and observe things about other people. And we may not like an attitude or a behavior or not agree with it, or it may not be the one that we would adopt, but when we adopt a forgiving, compassionate, and non-judgmental approach to how we look at other human beings in general, and we we stick to that, um, it is much easier for we help people with that attitude to grow and change, first of all. And also, when it comes to our own karma, when it's time for us to be judged and evaluated, we receive mercy because we give mercy. It's that simple. It's like you 
buy into a paradigm of humility and how you talk about or perceive truth and you receive the dividends, which is that when it comes time to learn and grow, it's gentle. Uh, when it comes time to learn and grow as a person, if you've been non-judgmental, you, you also receive that compassionate, sensitive touch. And there's a general rule at work karmically in the universe that sages everywhere have talked about, which is that this is the sort of way that on, on one level, this is how things work. Of course, there's another level that's very, you know, tit for tat, but it's sort of like adopt humility as an outlook in life, uh, which is not to say that you diminish yourself in any way, but it is to say that you don't, you just, you, you sit in the right place, you know, and uh, that and non-judgment go a long way. They're a lot softer. And that is a liberating or freeing idea. Mercury Uranus can often coincide with great moments of saying, I'm going to stop thinking I know everything, or I'm going to stop thinking I know everything about this person. Change isn't the same as newness. We always want newness because newness feels so good. Um, and But we try to get to newness, which I would equate, by the way, newness, I would equate with like the essence of life, like the spirit, the living spirit. I would call that newness. People want newness. And I see this in my practice all the time, right? C consulting with people, hearing so many different people, what they want, what they desire, what, what their aim is in life. Newness is a big part of it. I want to feel like I'm in touch with the essence of the spirit of life itself, which is like a wellspring. But we try to get there, and I'm guilty of this. I'm sure most of you listening to this can relate. We try to get there by making constant changes. It's like the same reason we're scrolling all the time, you know? It's like, they just... If I can just modulate and uh, change the basic stuff around me all the time, then it sort of resembles the ever-living, ever-present, ever-renewable spirit. But it's not the real thing. Just constantly making changes for the sake of making changes or constantly staying stimulated and doing different things. Um, it's like, a, it's like a, an addictive uh, base substitute for getting in touch with something essential, which is why what we really need to consider is that some of them, like if you want to get in touch with something that is really close to the essence of life, you want to feel that newness. It's so much more about a change of consciousness than it is about just saying, well, like if I get a new car or if I change relationships constantly or if I change jobs all the time or, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with changing any of those things, right, uh, on principle. It's just that when we take a grass is greener approach with Mercury Uranus and we go, oh, this new thing, this will, this will make me feel youthful and alive and free and liberated. Uranus lives very closely to that living fire of um, the spirit that we want to get in touch with. Mercury Uranus says, do this new thing, change, make this change, and then you'll be close to it. And then it isn't, it isn't, it isn't. Over and over again, we try new things and they just, they don't work. And so, you know, you think about meditation, you think about prayer, you think about the lives of creatives, the staying close to the living spirit is almost always a practice. It is something that comes through consistency and devotion. So there's a lot of days that are chopping of wood and carrying of water, but you know that if you attend to the living spirit through a, a kind of devotional approach, and there are I, there are innumerable devotional approaches to life, lifestyles, life practices, creative practices, spiritual practices, but it's that tending to something in familiar, constant ways over long periods of time that tend to bring us close to the living spirit of newness. This is why some of the most present, you know, happy people are often people who have very deeply devoted lifestyles or practices to something, to their garden, to their instrument, to their writing, to their friendships, whatever it is, you, but you attend to it, you know? And when we try to tend to ourselves constantly we end up just making changes because it's basically just like oh, I'm, I'm trying to eat a different kind of food that will emotionally satisfy me you know it's like it's like emotional eating we're, we're trying to 
fill ourselves. And so we change things constantly. Whereas when you tend to something outside of yourself, which you're involved in, obviously, like a garden or like a prayer practice, or, you know, for me, the past couple of years, it's been, you know, uh, several hours of physical exercise every day, which is, you know, totally different from where I've been in my past. But whatever it is, you're tending to something. And it's that attending to over time with devotion that brings you close to the living spirit of life because life itself is sacrificial. Life itself is giving. And so when you give, you get in touch with the living spirit of life itself, whose nature is generosity, whose nature is abundance, right? So we have to shift from constant change in self-service to constant devotion uh, to processes, practices, things that we tend to and love. And that's people, that's places, that's things, that's ideas, that's books, that's, you know, whatever. Number five, this is the radical idea I'll leave you with, is that sometimes the real revolution is found in commitment. It's just as simple as saying, we don't always have to change something for something, for a radical breakthrough to happen. Maybe making adjustments, in other words, or revisions within existing structures is the real revolution, as opposed to constantly needing to break them apart, which is itself a very radical Mercury Uranus kind of idea. So anyway, I thought this would be fun following on the video I did, I don't know, it was a week or two ago on Venus and Uranus and some radical ideas between the two of them. I thought, let's follow it up with one on Mercury Uranus. So I hope this serves you. This is, uh, this for me, this practice every day is a part of my devotional life. And I will tell you, I, I, it, gives so much more than I could possibly give to it. I feel like I receive so much more than I could possibly receive, which is why in some ways, even though it's five days a week year round, it doesn't feel like work. It, I mean, some days it does, let's be real, but it, it, in that devotional connection to making this content, I feel like I just I receive a lot spiritually, emotionally, psychologically from all of you from the process of making it. So anyway, that is it for now. I hope you're having a good one and uh, we will see you again soon.